Hey, it's me. Yeah, hey, I, this is more complicated than I realized. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep screwing it up. I, no, you don't. Uh, <laughs> it's all right. Yeah, tell me what I should do. I, you sent me a note saying you do it in an hour. Is that what you said? Oh no, I, that was at at three. I was telling you, I'll call you in an hour. <laughs> okay, uh, tell me. I'm already. I just. I'm sorry, man. Whatever you want me to do. Well, we're uh, we're doing it. Basically, I would define this as a freewheeling conversation. There are no <laughs> right or wrong answers. You can express yourself in any way. Myself and my listeners, we are here to listen. Well, so, that's very kind. Thanks, <laughs> Paul. So, uh, all right, let me... Hello? Are you here? The Paul Leslie Hour is here. One thousand times over, we are. Welcome to episode number one thousand. <laughs> the Paul Leslie Hour has released manifold interviews through the years. We've welcomed authors, musicians, actors, presidential candidates, and myriad other interesting people. Today, we hit a milestone. None of this would have been worth it or even possible without you, the audience. So, thank you. We're honored any time that you're here. And if you want to help us as we move onward from here, please visit www.thepaullesley.com slash support and give yourself and others the gift of stories. Thank you. As we've built this mountain of stories, our guest today has earned his place at the top of the heap. He has been an orphan, an adoptee, a journalist, a lobbyist, a diplomat, the director of The Voice of America, a husband, a single father, a grandfather, family man, a patriot, and a mentor. Our guest bears good fruit with an illustrious life that believes in judging a person based on how far he goes. Our guest is the father of Buckley and Tucker Carlson. Our 1,000th guest is quite a man. So settle into your favorite chair, grab a drink, light up your pipe, take your favorite listening device on a walk or maybe a drive, and get ready to enjoy the interview of interviews. Now let's hear the voices we've been waiting for. Paul Edward Leslie and Mr. Dick Carlson in a comfortable conversation. Let me start off by saying that I am no longer in Chevy Chase, Maryland, where I lived for a long time, and I moved to Florida. I moved down here around, right around Christmas time, and I'm presently in a little house on Gasparilla Island, and, and I'm on the beach, actually, where I'm about 75 yards from the beach, looking out my front window. So that's where I am at the moment. Well, that's that's a, a lovely place to be. I am currently a little farther from the coast, but I'm I'm off the coast of Carolina, and uh -huh. it's a great honor to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us. This is our 1,000th interview, and you're a man who has worn many hats, journalist, diplomat, lobbyist, magazine writer, correspondent on television and radio. It's important to note that you're a father, a novelist. Now, get this, folks. Some of the titles he's written, they range from Snatching Hillary to Why Dogs Can Talk on Christmas Eve. Now, <laughs> with this introduction, this is a man with some stories to tell. It's a great honor to have you with us. Well, thank you, Paul. It's, uh, it's very complimentary, and I, I sound like more of an interesting person than I really am. So that's always a nice thing. And thanks for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure. So should I call you Mr. Carlson or Richard Carlson, or, or how would you like to be addressed? 
Well, call me Dick it would be just great. Okay. All right. Well, Dick, it is. And feel free to call me Paul. Dick, what has surprised you most about your life? <laughs> That's a good question. I'm not heavily into reflection. I, I'm sure that I'm a type, and, and, and this type doesn't usually do a lot of introspecting and looks at itself. But I guess what, but when I think about this, and I have thought about it lately, I'm, I'm 83. I turned 83 not long ago in February, February 10th. So I was born in 1941 and, and grew up in an entirely different time in America. And looking at my life as best I'm capable, the surprises are, are, are many. I, one of the major surprises is that I, that I have lived so long, much longer than I would have anticipated. And, and I'm pretty happy about that. And I've had a chance to do a lot of things that I thought initially thought would have been interesting to do. And, and, and I, and they proved to be so. I, I had, you, you may or may not know this. I, you probably do know it. I, I was a merchant seaman for a while on, on a, I was an ordinary seaman on a freighter and the Washington Bear was the name of the ship. And it was a great experience. And I, I did that. I was a UPI reporter at the time that I joined the Seamen's Union and I did it because I could. I just happened to be sitting next to the head of the Seamen's Union of the Pacific, whose name is Morris Weisberger then. And it was a long time left wing agitator and, and Seamen's Union person. And I was sitting at a luncheon next to him and he and I got in, into a dispute of sorts. And I basically had said to him that the, I was under the impression that you couldn't get into his union without paying a bribe. So that was basically, greatly disappointing to me, I said. And I infuriated him and he, he then called me at UPI and a couple of days later and said if I wanted to be a, an ordinary seaman on a ship, there was one leaving on Friday night from Pier 45 in San Francisco. And I have a position in the union as an ordinary seaman and I could go join them if I would like. And he challenged me by saying that and it was on a Wednesday, and I gave notice at UPI, and I worked in the San Francisco Bureau then. I had not been there very long, and and I then went down, bought some old clothes, and and then used the clothes that I had that were pretty old anyway, and went down and, and climbed the ladder to the ship at about 20 of 12, and, and ended up sailing with them, Washington Bayer, and maybe 20 crew members. Captain Bozen's mate, that, and, or there were six ordinary seamen. I was one of them. Ordinaries is what they refer to them as. And, and I was a union member, temporarily at least, thanks to Mr. Weisberger. I didn't realize when I did this that I would have the animus of, of the other union members, but I did. I just was too stupid to realize it, so I didn't worry about it because I didn't know they hated me as much as they did. They thought I was some smart alecky college boy who, who had used a political leverage to get into the union. And by the time I realized that I was intensely disliked, they had moved over to my side and were friendly to me. And uh, that was a, after we'd been at sea for a little while. We went from San Francisco to LA and to the port in Los Angeles and then headed for uh, Asia. And so we were at sea for a couple of weeks. And by then, I inadvertently moved the crew to my side and mostly by teaching them how to play backgammon. They were big gamblers and they, you think they would have known how to play backgammon, but they didn't. And I had a backgammon set with me and was the only one on board the ship. And I, one at a time, gave lessons on playing backgammon and using it as a gambling game, which is a very good gambling game. And so by the time we arrived in Japan, they were all they couldn't wait to get off the ship and buy their own backgammon board. And, and I was uh, friendly with them and, and made the rest of my trip a happy one. And uh, we were over there for six or seven months and sailing between ports, some, some assigned, some not, and uh, during an interesting time in the world. So that, so anyway, that was my initial, my initial recruitment to merchant seamanism. And it was successful and I was uh, happy doing it. 
Very interesting. So we can add that to the the list of all those titles. <laughs> so tell us, Dick, with all those different things, writer, merchant seaman, diplomat, there, there's, there's so many things there. Is there a role you felt most suited to? Well, that's interesting. I I was, yes, in a general sense, I, I, I felt qualified to be a storyteller. And, and I... And I think it was a pretty good one, actually. I did it as a, as a merchant seaman, and I did it as a UPI reporter, and and I did it later in various journalistic roles, some of which were were compelling, and some of which were not. And but I, I liked it very much, and 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 I spent the rest of my life, in effect, telling stories of one kind or another. I worked at the Voice of America, and I became the director of the Voice of America, which was a a, a very influential Cold War organization back when I went there. And I did that for a number of years, and I ran Radio Marti into Cuba as well. Ran it in the sense that I was, I had overall, overall responsibility for it and took it seriously and was uh, interested in it. The same with the Voice of America. And ended up with, they were, I had 4,000 employees at most of them in a building in, on Independence Avenue in Washington, and then, and then even spread around the world in, in various posts of one kind or another. And we had an effect on, on, on society in a lot of places in a positive way because we broadcast principally to, in, in languages, native languages, to people who had no other source of information other than the, their government, and which in this case was the Soviet the Soviet regime or its its allies. So consequently, they didn't get any straight news at all. And, and the Voice of America supplied it to them in their native language. And it was a worthwhile thing to do. And, and I'm, and I was a very happy person doing it. Hmm. Well, I'm pleased that that's a label that you like, because the tagline for our show is helping people tell their stories. And I want to get a go back pretty far with this one. Most stories are best from the beginning. So, Dick Carlson, what are your earliest memories? Well, lately, I turned 83 not too long ago, and I'm old enough that I uh, have a lot of reason to think about my life, and I have done more introspection than I had done previously, and it was a good thing. And I think that my earliest memories are being with my parents, the Carlsons, who, in fact, had adopted me. I wasn't aware of that then. When I was adopted, I was three, almost three, about two months short of three. And they adopted me from an orphanage in Boston called the Home for Little Wanderers. It's a great name for an orphanage, I have to say, and uh, still exists, too, by the way, the Home for Little Wanderers. So I was adopted by the Carlsons. My father, Mr. Carlson, was a, a ran a tannery. He actually was one of three managers of a tannery. He didn't run it by himself. It was the largest tannery in the United States then. It was in Norwood, Massachusetts. It was called the, the company was called Winslow Brothers and Smith, and it prepared hides and its leather products for manufacturers of shoes and handbags and and things like that. So. You know, he did that, and I was adopted by he and his wife, Ruth, who was a registered nurse, had been a registered nurse, middle-class family, and they lived in a small town of about 16,000 people then, called Norwood, Massachusetts. It's about a dozen miles south of Boston. And I lived with them, and I went, and my father ran the tannery with, with two other people. He was a, was a manager. It was split duties with two other men. And I went to work with him every Saturday. I, I would go down to, after I was adopted at age three, I would go down to the, to the tannery with him, which was this, still exists actually. It's, it's stopped work a long time ago, but it, it's, the buildings are still there. And I would go and ride around on top of a cart laden with hides. And as my father did work in his office and, and he churned my, Responsibility for me over to one of the workers there, Mr. Fagus from, who used to 
was to drive me, in effect, in a wagon load of love. And I learned a lot at this time. I was busy every Saturday in the sense of being an, an observer at the Winslow Brothers and Smith Tannery. And unfortunately, that tannery went on strike and it, it closed after a, a lengthy and violent strike in the 19, in 1949. And uh, so I was then eight years old. My father was out of work. They closed the tannery. It never reopened. And it's it's still there today, as a matter of fact. And all the buildings are there. And my father then went off to New Hampshire and ran a small tannery there for some affiliated owners of, of the Winslow Brothers and Smith Tannery. And he stayed there for, a, oh, I don't know, six months, something like that. And my mother and I would drive up and, and visit him. I had no brothers and sisters. I was an only child, albeit an adopted child who was not aware of that adoption part until some years later. But my father ran his tannery up in New Hampshire on a lake until until he didn't. I, mean, I think they closed that one, too. But he then moved with my mother. They sold their little house in Norwood, Mass., and they moved to Rhode Island, where he gained employment as a wool broker. That is exactly what it sounds like. Somebody who was selling skins, and some of them with wool on them, some not. And he did that, and he, he, I was with him, and we had a small house, a little house in in East Providence, Rhode Island. It was commonly known as Riverside, Rhode Island. And I was there with him until he died of a heart attack at age 45 in 1954. And my mother, who hadn't worked in years, was a registered nurse, was uh, had to go back to work and did. Sold their little house and we moved into Providence and, and Rhode Island itself and, uh, and, and worked. And I, I got you know, various jobs and which were always they were great for me. As a matter of fact, the death of my father was a, uh, my adopted father was a, uh, somewhat of a trauma, but I already had some trauma in my life, so I could handle it. And I did handle it uh, well. And, and I used it to some extent in the development of my own character and my own interests and, and, and such as that. Dick, do you feel a commonality when you've met somebody who was adopted? Well, that's a good question. I, I, I actually don't particularly, but I, uh, that's, that's a good question. I certainly have met a lot of people who were adopted and I paid particular interest, obviously, for reasons that are apparent. But I, I don't know. I, I spent my, I, I made a, a film on this subject one time. It was about women who give up their children for adoption and I did this after I had gone into television work. And I became friendly with Rod McEwen, who was was actually quite famous then, not probably not famous now at all, but well, as an author and a writer and a, and a, a guy who who would, uh, was seeking information about his own life and his own adoption and and so forth. And and I ended up making a television show with McEwen as the host, and called Hello Again, and about people about people who gave up their child to adoption and then the story of the of the child pursuing more information about that and then tracking down the pa- parents as I did not a common thing in those days and there was nobody willing to be very helpful to you on that subject if you were the adopted person people felt sure sympathy for you but they weren't all that keen on giving you uh, any any boost in in the information gathering at all and, and they didn't either. So, but, but McEwen, who was enormously popular as a book writer and, and made millions of dollars at it, had only gone to the third grade. His mother was a, part, frankly, was a part-time prostitute and who dragged this boy, this fatherless child with her everywhere she went. And, uh, and McEwen ended up writing these books that were very appealing to some people. And in my case, I, I had met him. He was so, he was looking for his father. He didn't know who his father was. And I offered to help him in return for him playing some role in a documentary that I wanted to make and, and, and did make for NBC, a television 
and uh, and so I so I I knew him quite well. He's been dead for a long time and is not famous any longer. But but anyway, he was extremely helpful to me in in narrating this film and that I made called Hello Again, and it ran on as a as a documentary in effect on NBC. Fifty years ago, I guess it was a long time. So, and then I ended up talking to a lot of people who had been adopted, not people that I normally would have had any anything to do with, but I was glad to, and and I, I helped in small ways. I helped many of them, and I'm glad that I did. Such an interesting connection. We have a good good friend of ours, Jeff Pike, who is. Jeff is a huge Rod McEwen fan, and he exposed oh. a lot of our listeners to some of his recordings. Some people might know of Rod McEwen's association with the late, great Frank Sinatra, but I, I'm glad I asked that question. Well, yeah, that's fascinating. When you say uh, Sinatra, I, there was a connection. I, my, my partner in filmmaking then and in the early news business was Lance Brisson, who is still alive, and who is the only child of Rosalind Russell, who was a, quite a famous actress then in those days, and uh, principally, but not only, because of her role as Auntie Mame. So Ms. Brisson, I knew Ms. Br- Mrs. Brisson really well, and, and, and Lance and I worked together, so I had, a, I had had a real occasion to be involved in a lot of this stuff because of him. His father was a producer named Freddie Brisson, and anyway, they were very helpful to me, very kind to me over the years, too, in, in getting started in the news business, which Lance and I shot television film at night in San Francisco in the early 60s, and then sold it, in some cases, under the table. That is because of union regs. We sold it to Roger Grimsby, who was then a well-known anchor guy, later well-known in New York as an anchor man. And, uh, and a big supporter of ours. That is Lance Fasson and me. But we shot, for two years, we shot crime stories basically in San Francisco in the Bay Area and then sold them, which was legal from a union perspective, to Roger Grimsby, assuming he had, on the, on the basis that he didn't order them. They were made available to him by us. And then he was allowed by union regulation to pay for them, which he did. And he paid us, and we made a few hundred dollars a week for a couple of years uh, doing that. And then we built a, a beginning in the news business and ultimately went off, Lance and I did, and we made a, a, a documentary film on hobos in America. That is, people who use the railroads to travel from one workplace to another, of which there were thousands of them. It was amazing. And they, they had then, and I think they have now, a convention every year in Britt, Iowa, this little town that I went to <laughs> with Lance and a bunch of hobos in, in 1964 or so. And uh, we made this film, and hello again, as I told you. And, and it was narrated by Rod McEwen for free. Normally, he would have charged a large amount of money, but he did it for nothing for us because of his, because of our work trying to, trying to locate who his father was had been, and we did uh, look at him, actually, and, and th- discovered things about his his mother, and so on, th- things you would probably rather not know, because there are a lot, of, a lot of secrets in the world, and some of them are uh, floating around, and they're available, but do you really want to know that your mother was a part-time prostitute? No, you probably don't, but in this case, we discovered a lot of things that were useful, or intellectually useful anyway, to to people like Rod McEwen, and, and we formed a, Lance and I did, formed a, a basic relationship with Roger Grimsby, who was a powerful ABC News executive then, and, uh, and it was all, all to the good. We have a listener question. Yes. Thank you so much to Robert McCready for this. He is on Twitter at Evening Magic. Here is Robert's question for you. What advice do you have for working class people who want to do something significant with their lives? Yeah, that's well, it's probably a little, (laughs) probably a little heady for me to respond to. In a a good way, I, 
whatever pomposities I have, I gave a lot of them up a long time ago. But <laughs> there, there, there are a lot of, a lot of very worthwhile things that can be done by people who have not, who don't have the right connections in college and didn't go to the right prep school and all of those kinds of things. And I, I'm one of those people. And having that opportunity to work, as I did at 12, my father died when I was 12. My adopted father, and 1940, 1954, I was 12. I took a job immediately on a truck that went two mornings in the week, in, in the week from our little house in Rhode Island into Providence to pick up vegetables and produce for a supermarket. It was then called a supermarket. It was just like a large market. I went with a truck driver, and he naturally I pushed him to let me drive the truck. I'm 12 years old, but I, it's a big floor shift. That, anyway, so I learned how to drive a truck right away from him. And then we would go in and have a cup of coffee. I had never had coffee in my life. And we'd pick up all the vegetables and bring them back down to the store and unload it. And then he would, he, the fellows who drove, his name was Tommy Dolan, was a student at Providence College. He would then drop me off at my house where I lived alone with my mother. And I would change my clothes and head off to school for to catch the 8.30 school bus to school. Anyway, and all of that was enormously helpful to me in the sense of exposing me to people and events and things that I would never have seen and benefited from playing a role in, in, in seeing them. I felt my life was rich already just by dint of, of being able to go in and, at an early time in the morning and, and deliver these vegetables and then head off to school. I was a lousy student, too, because I was gone a lot. So I skipped school a lot and was kind of a flaky character, I think. In many ways, I, I drank a lot then when I was 15, you know, and I was very active in juvenile delinquency of a sort that seems kind of mild now, frankly, in, in thinking about it on my part, but, but nonetheless was uh, real. And, and at the same time, maintaining some good social connections, which I did. And I still, I may have been a juvenile delinquent, but I still got invited to good parties. My, my closest friend then was a guy named John Drew. And John's father was a society orchestra band leader named Ed Drew. So Mr. Drew always had John and I invited to various social events by virtue of being related to, to Mr. Drew. And uh, so I got invited to coming out parties and I got invited to black tie events. And I made sure the first thing I ever paid money for was a black tie <laughs> tuxedo, which I did. And then I used that to kind of improve my social scores, and which was not hard to do and uh, and very worthwhile. I sure met a lot of interesting people, particularly women that doing that. and uh, And I'm grateful for it all. Well, I'm very glad Robert asked that question because your answer was was very good. It kind of reminds me of something that I wanted to ask you. I read Chadwick Moore's biography entitled Tucker, which is one of the better biographies that I've read, and I have a house full of biographies. That's my, my favorite genre of books. But he used a word, and it's one of my favorite words, he used this word to describe you. He said that you are egalitarian. What do you think of that description of you? Well, I don't even remember reading that he said that, but I, but I, but it's true, really. And I've tried to practice that kind of fair-minded look at other people all my life. One, one could say we had little choice. Actually, I had you know. No social forebears to re, to rely on, and just uh, traveling with a rolled up tuxedo in my bag and and going to uh, fancy parties and talking to interesting women was part of the deal, and I uh, and I liked it a, a lot. I have to say, and it was extremely useful to me. And uh, no matter what it was that I was doing, whether I was a, I was a merchant seaman, I told you, a member of the Seamen's Union of the Pacific (SUP), and I was. A member of that union for many years, though I only went on one, on one long, ordinary seaman trip. But it was a great experience for me, and I, I, I loved it, and I, 
and I loved the, the union for it, for making it available to me. And, and I consider myself very fortunate that I, I would hope that there are others like me who grow up without social connections and, you know, grew up in some genuinely unpleasant background, which was mine in many ways. I've seen the original ad from, from in the Boston Globe, I think it was, and it said, a home wanted for foundling, call the home for little wonders, and, and that was me, actually. I was a couple of months old, and I had been turned over to the home for little wanderers, and I then was, um, was, it was marked as a, an adoptable kid, and I was taken in by a family that had a real effect on me. I don't remember them at all, but I years, met them years later, and when they tracked me down, and they were a school teacher, and the husband was an engineer, and, and, and the woman was, a, the wife was the school teacher, and uh, they were wonderful folks. And they played a great role in my life by by taking me in and and uh, treating me kindly and introduced me. I have uh, one of my dogs is right here. I have a love of dogs that I came that clearly came from the people who adopted me and had a they had a big dog and I I, I grew to love that dog and I have a good relationship with the animals because of that. And, I, and the, the th same thing was true with with uh, Rod McEwen when he. He did that uh, film. He narrated the film for nothing. Normally, he would have charged, I don't know, probably fifty thousand dollars then, a substantial amount of money. But he didn't charge me anything. He just did it for nothing. And the men wrote a book about it called "Finding My Father," which has a lot to do with with me. And one of my dogs is bugging me here. Hi, 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 hi. So anyway, uh, it was. Uh, I'm sorry. Eighty-three year olds tend to wander if not physically, emotionally. And that's probably what I've been doing right here. No, well, not at all. It, it actually provides an interesting segue because you wrote that book, Why Dogs Can Talk on Christmas Eve. My dad, yeah. I was mourning the loss of a dog, and my dad said something to me. He said that dogs are a gift from God and that basically he said in so many words, we don't deserve them. And I, I was hoping you could tell us, Dick, what is it that you love about dogs? Man's best friend. Ah, that's a good, that's a, an interesting question, and I, I guess it's their uh, their wonderful loyalty and their eager, loving attitudes. Which my, I, have, I have two little dogs named Lucy and Ethel, who are sitting right here. One of them is, <laughs> and, and and they're loving towards me. And I, it's not you can do no harm, love, but close to it. And I mean, they're really very accepting of of life as it is, and and that's enormously appealing to a lot of people and to me for sure. And I, my my children, I have two sons, Tucker and Buckley, who grew up with. I was a single father for three or four years, and and raised them to, and they they loved their animals. We had a couple of dogs, and they loved them, and and they're better people for it. There's no doubt in my head about that and I, and and I am too. So I'm I'm grateful to Rod McEwen for all he did for me and uh, for his kindness about animals. He was a was a, a real animal guy, real animal person and, and uh, so am I. I yeah. <laughs> That's always good to hear and it's a, a good sign if I walk up to somebody's house and I see a dog wagging its tail I think it, it says a lot. It says the dog is happy, and it also says that the I'm probably walking up on a, a good house. But you mentioned a moment ago, you are the father of two, Buckley and Tucker. Yes. What would people be surprised to know about your sons? Well, I, I, I don't know. They're very normal, and I think their normality is and actually a, a product of real abnormality. I there was a period I raised those boys. They came to live with me when they was they were about a year and a half apart, so they were three and five at the time, three and a half and five. And we lived at that time. I was the anchorman on a CBS station in San Diego. I was the anchorman for a year before I quit and decided I would find something better to do. Really, in effect, and 
but, they, but anyway, they lived with me, and we and we had a had a great life. The mother, they had no mother. Their mother left and moved to Europe, and never came back. And they to shorten it all, they never saw her again. And I took over the role of of both parents, and it, it wasn't all that hard, actually. And it was very rewarding for me, well, wildly rewarding, actually. And I'm just really so glad that I did it. I, the boys and I lived in a little rented house in La Jolla, La Jolla Shores, great area. It's a great area for a rental house, but you wouldn't want to have to buy a house because it's health expensive. Anyway, we lived there while I was on television. And then when the year it was up, I knew I was going to quit television and do something else. And I did. I became, I was well known in San Diego because for that period I was on my picture was on the side of every bus and, and so on. But then I quit television and I went in the banking business. And I did that because of its stability and that I thought that it was a, something worthwhile for me to, to be engaged in with the children and uh, who then were little guys. And I did that for a number of years, actually. And uh, as I became the senior executive of, of a a large S and L as a savings and loan. And I did that for, I don't know, you know, eight or 10 years and, and it did it successfully. And I was very happy with my, my life actually. And, and the kids were too. And I then I had gotten divorced. I had custody of the boys and I, I ended up uh, remarrying to a woman who was my neighbor <laughs> actually. Patricia Carlson. We were together. We were married in 79 and she became the boy's mother uh, in effect. And it was a wonderful person. She died not too long ago. She died right before Christmas this past year. And I then moved from where we were living in Chevy Chase. I then moved to a little town in Gasparilla Island in Florida, which is where I am right now. And Patricia, I have her picture sitting on the mantel across from me, but otherwise our time together ended and on her death. That's, but those things happen to every person, right? And yeah. In my case, I was lucky to live to 83. I consider myself extremely fortunate and of being around so long and having two kids. With a, I have a great relationship with them, with Tucker and Buckley, and who have been very successful in the things that they do, but mostly successful as parents. They're really good at, at their job as father <laughs> and, and as a husband. I'm happy about that, and I think they are too. You're certainly sorry for your loss, uh, the loss of your wife, Dick. Well, thank you for saying that. She was a terrific person. Patricia, her name was Patricia Swanson, maiden name was Swanson. She was uh, a friend of, to a lot of people, and a friend to a lot of animals as well. She was a kind-hearted hmm. a woman, a kind-hearted person. So anyway, we respect her around here, don't we, buddy? I'm talking to one of my dogs here. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, in just the last year, when I think about Tucker Carlson's broadcasting and interviews, it's been quite quite a time. I mean, just off the top of my head, he's had the opportunity to interview Elon Musk He's had the chance to talk to President Trump. You know, it's been, admittedly, it seems like he's knocking the ball right out of the park. I'm curious, as a viewer, has there been a favorite broadcast or interview of Tucker's that you can recall? Well, that's interesting. I I did pay some attention to. He did a two-hour interview with, with the leader of the former Soviet Union. Right. Mr. Putin. And he went over and was spent time with him and then did was not a sympathetic interview. The problem with for Tucker and people like me who have a, a point of view and they is that they're often attacked for that point of view. As right. Tucker has been well he's a right winger, he's a left winger and there's a lot of that stuff that goes on. He actually doesn't care. He he's not not, not a person who cares at all about it and uh, my my housekeeper just arrived in the background. <laughs> I, I'm doing a radio interview. Yeah, that's all right. No problem. So I've got a lady who, without her, I would be totally shafted. 
she's she's here helping me with my dogs in my life and uh, at five o'clock in the afternoon in Florida. So, but but Tucker's interview with with Putin was very successful and and illuminating in in many ways as well. And he's had a he has a he has millions of listeners apparently and people who look at his his stuff on on his network Tucker Carlson News I think the network is called right. it's remarkable yeah anyway he's a good guy too wow he's a, he's a good father and he he well, anyway, he's a, he's an excellent person as is Buckley it's always good to hear Dick has there been a person who has made an especially significant impact or influence in your life that comes to your mind? Well, yes, there, there are a couple. One of them was a, a lawyer named Jake Ehrlich. Jake is uh, from another generation entirely. He's dead for many years, but he was a powerful, intellectually powerful attorney in San Francisco in the, in the 50s and 60s and became a close friend of mine. And get, I was thinking of becoming a lawyer then. And so I met with Jake in his office. He was a criminal defense lawyer. And I met with him every Saturday morning for an hour or two. And he would convey the latest in his life of intrigue, well, you know, you know, life loaded with intrigue. And, and it was, he was enormously helpful to me intellectually. And actually was helpful in, in my not becoming a, a trial lawyer thinking that I could do more interesting work and as a reporter. And, and that was a, a person who influenced me in that regard was a woman named Cassie Mackin, Catherine Mackin, who I had a romantic interest in, interest in going way back. And she was really the first woman television correspondent that I ever knew of. Actually, Catherine Mackin, she died early. She died many years ago, early, but she was a, a remarkable person and and played a real role in my life, and for which I am grateful. You know. How do you define what it is to be an American? Ah, that's a good, that's a good question. I, <laughs> probably one I should have thought about before, but I didn't. <laughs> but I think, you know, I, I know how I I feel about it. I, egalitarianism is real part of that. Is a genuine part of that uh, look to be an American. You you have to not make bad judgments about other people without knowing a lot about them. And I think that's a, something that Americans do. And I and I and I like that. Dick, there's been a song that's been going around and around in my head the last couple of weeks, and I, I think it's a song that it, it's a song with a lot of truth. And I'm talking about That's Life, the song Frank Sinatra made famous. I'm curious, Dick, what is the best way to handle hard times, do you think? Well, that's I certainly I had a little history of relatively hard times. And I met them head on when my, my, my adopted father died when I was 12 years old in 1954. And I immediately... But actually, I didn't think I had any intellectual choices involved. I immediately got a job and two, two mornings a week, I had loaded produce and, uh, and food on a truck. So I did that. And then, you know, I, I got a lot out of that, learned a lot out of it. It was, a, it was an excellent experience for me. I did know Sinatra well. I just, my grand, I have a granddaughter, one of Tucker Carlson's children, the oldest child. Her name was Lily, and I, I had a silver cigarette box, sterling, quite quite big, actually, and it says on it, engraved on it, says Frank and Mia, and then a date, and it's for cigarettes. You know, people people don't use cigarette boxes anymore, but I had received it from Frank Sinatra. I and other people had, I wasn't the only person who received it, and because of the minor role that I played in his Getting together with Mia Farrow, he married Mia Farrow back in the early 60s, around 64 or 5, and they were married for a while. And I played a role in that inadvertently, and because of my friendship with Lance Brisson and with Mr. Brisson's father. And, but anyway, the 
So I gave that silver cigarette box to my granddaughter. I'm not sure she recognized the, the interesting emergency of it at the time, but nonetheless, she did. So that's, that's that. <laughs> Dick, in, in, do you have any closing words as we, we bring the end of this broadcast? You could go absolutely anywhere you like for anyone who's tuned in with us. Well, that's very kind. And, uh, Paul, thanks for the opportunity. I'm not, I'm not a very, I'm an elderly guy who's not a very good storyteller anymore, but I have to say my life was, it was so worthwhile for me through my children and my grandchildren. That was the important part for me. That is the important part. And something I was not fully aware of back when, but I'm very aware of now. And I, I like that a lot. And I feel good about it. I feel good about my grandchildren. And when I leave this orb, sometime, I don't know when, hopefully not not tomorrow, but sometime in the next couple of years, the uh, I leave behind some interesting and intellectually motivated grandchildren and, and relatives. And I'm, I'm thankful for that, really thankful, actually. And I feel like I've done something with my life beyond what I would have expected back in 1940s and in the in the little town that I lived in. But it's been a wonderful time, I must say. Well, Dick Carlson, thank you so much for sharing these moments with me, with all of us. I don't take any of my interviews for granted, and it's it's always wonderful to connect with somebody. Your stories have been very interesting. I've found you entertaining and inspiring, and I hope all the folks out there listening would agree with me. I wish you a wonderful evening, and all the best, sir. Well, thank you, Paul. Thanks for having me on. I'm an old guy living in Florida, but my my intellect is still drifting around back east somewhere, and uh, and I'm grateful for the life that I was able to lead, and there were so many people who made it possible, and I'm grateful to them, too. But thanks for the chance to talk to your audience, and I hope you'll give me that chance again sometimes. Oh, um, I would I love would, it. Thanks. Me, too. I'd be delighted as well. Paul, hey, thanks. Thank you. All you Paul Lefty listeners, thank you very much for tuning in, and I hopefully I'll talk to you again sometime. Yes, sir. All right. All thank right. You. Have a great one. You too, buddy. Bye. Bye. Hey, it's me again. Just wanted to say a few words here at the end of the 1,000th episode. Thank you to Dan Gold. He's the man you hear at the beginning of every episode with that golden voice. I get so many compliments. Who is that man at the beginning, they ask. This episode has an introduction written by Robert McCready. Thank you, Robert. Great writing, as always. And thank you. I know you have lots and lots of options in this day and time. Many things to watch, many things to listen to, but you chose to listen to this. When I think about these 1,000 episodes, it's been a lot of people that I've had the chance to meet. So many. Very grateful for that. Many of you came for just a moment. Some came on again and again. Some have left us. This goes for not just the guests, but even the audience, the listeners out there. I have nothing but gratitude. Thank you for sharing this moment with me, with us. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being here. We thank you and appreciate you dropping in for the Paul Leslie Hour today. You know, you can help the Paul Leslie Hour in our mission to provide independent media content like this by visiting www.thepaulleslie.com slash support. We truly thank you. This is your announcer speaking. Performance of the Entertainer intro song and Corina Corina outro song courtesy of John Primerano. Well, that's it for today. So until next time, be safe and be good. <laughs>